The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Well, hello out there. You're right. I'm not Marissa Levy singing Breathing Fire. I am the host, co-host of the Crashing Glass podcast, Holly Hurley. And I just want to give you a message about BaseNetTV.com that carries this and other amazing content. Do you know if you go to BaseNetTV.com right now and donate, 20% of what you give will go towards actually curing cancer, the Jimmy Fund, very, very progressive treatments there and wonderful, wonderful doctors. And we're going to be giving it to them at a super fun event, the Scooper Bowl, which I understand, Jill, are you going to be at the Scooper Bowl? I am going to be at the Scooper Bowl, so please, yeah, and we're going to cover the Scooper Bowl for, uh, for BaseNet TV um, in our segment called About Boston. So when you do go to the website, basenettv.com, please consider giving even a, a dollar, five dollars, whatever, to, to keep our programming so that we can bring you the podcast, the crashing glass, the as we see it, and also for our um, video things we have, which is About Boston, After Dark, and many more. And we're going to do the Jimmy Fun Scooper Bowl in June. We'll be bringing that to you as well as we just did another About Boston segment at Sky Zone Sports, which is a indoor trampoline park, which is crazy fun. So that's all I have for you. Well, that sounds like a really fun place to shake your tatas. Why don't we get into this week's show? I'm this week's Crashing Glass podcast. I'm your co-host Holly Hurley here with Jill Henley and this week we're talking about chicks with tatas and joining us is radiologist who specializes in breast cancer, Miss Kristen Coconas. Hello doctor. <laughs> Hi Holly. So Kristen, obviously this is a an issue that women especially care a lot about. Um, men, I know, I understand are diagnosed too. What are some of the, what are some of the statistics on that? Well, statistics for women is that one in eight women, 12% basically at some point during her life will, will develop an invasive breast cancer. And another important point and one that's sort of been related to some of the controversy that is currently debated over screening mammography is women who are in the age range from 40 to 50. And actually about one in 69 women in her 40s will be diagnosed with an invasive breast cancer. Uh, it is the second leading cause of cancer death in women after lung cancer. I don't have statistics on male breast cancer, but it is certainly very important. I see um, men every week in my practice who have lumps. Most of them aren't cancer, but it's male breast cancer actually is diagnosed usually at a later stage than female breast cancer because men just aren't thinking about it and tend to delay coming in and getting a uh, getting evaluated. So so it is important. I don't have the exact statistics with me, though. Okay. Nice. And uh, tell us a little bit. You mentioned your practice. Uh, tell us a little bit about your practice, where you're located, uh, where you work, that sort of stuff. So I work in uh, central Pennsylvania. Um, I mostly am uh, at a in a town called Danville, Pennsylvania, at Geisinger Medical Center. Uh, we have a number of other facilities that I will sometimes um, cover as well. And I do almost exclusively breast imaging, and that uh, involves um, interpreting screening mammography, which is mammography performed on asymptomatic women. I also do, um, did you say something? No, I think I just wanted to make sure that was clear. So screening mammography means kind of your annual or, your, you know, like a healthy checkup or a mammogram for a, a healthy woman. Yes, uh huh. Someone that has no complaints about her breasts, but is coming to just have that annual checkup. We also do what are called diagnostic mammograms, which are mammograms in either women who've had an abnormality noticed on their screening study, or women who have a symptom in their breast, or also women who've had uh, breast cancer in the past. We um, do what's called a diagnostic study, means meaning that the radiologist interprets the images while the patient is still there and that way the radiologist is able to request additional additional images to be taken in different projections or can actually talk to the patient and sort of understand what is going on in real time and so that patient will will have an answer from us before she leaves we also do breast MRI and um, biopsies either under mammographic ultrasound or MRI guidance that's basically the extent of 
of my work, I work closely with our breast surgeons at our hospital as well and our oncologists. So, so Kristen, if you have, I'm sorry, Holly, jump in. No, you go ahead. If you meet somebody on a day that you're, you're you know, reading their uh, their MRI or their mammogram, and do you fall end up following them? I'm just curious about this in terms of you know what what your work is week to week. Do you follow a woman who you may have you may see look, read her films, you know, as the radiologist, and then see something that needs to be looked at closer? Do you do you see like her after after a while, like the outcomes? Do you, do you get to make those relationships? Um, yes, uh, to some degree, not as much as uh, um, other types of doctors. I, um, you know, I do make a point to try to talk to most of my patients, and um, when they come in for their, maybe they'll come in for an initial diagnostic workup that may eventually lead to a biopsy. There are about four of us who I work, other doctors who I work closely with, who are radiologists who mostly do breast imaging as well, and we. We don't specifically intend for a patient to come back on the day. Like if she needs a biopsy, she doesn't necessarily come back on the day that we are, you know, assigned to do the biopsies. Um, some patients do request a certain radiologist, maybe if they've met someone and they feel comfortable with that person. But um, in general, we, um, you know, we're involved at in the diagnostic end of things, Um we are in close contact with the surgeons throughout the woman's care, including the MRIs are usually done after a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer or if she's at high risk. And we help through that process and certainly continue follow-up um, after she's been treated for her cancer. But, um, but it's certainly not as close as the surgeons or the oncologists or radiation oncologists have an involvement with their patients. But I know that that's one of your favorite, you know, your, the parts of the job that you do so much like is, is to sit down and be able to talk with, you know, the women that you see one on one. Yeah, I do enjoy my patients. So talk to me a little bit about that diagnosis process and what that's like and sort of what a woman can expect to, during that process. Okay. Well, so most women come to us, or I don't actually know if it's most, but a large number come through screening. And this is something that a lot of women have a lot of anxiety related to. We have, I guess, say if you have a thousand screening mammograms, about 10% or maybe a little bit less, uh, depending on the practice, will be called back for additional imaging. So they, you know, they come in, they have their screening, they go home. At some point, the radiologist interprets that and decides, you know, I need to make sure that this thing I see in the mammogram here isn't cancer. I need to make sure it's just the normal breast tissue lining up in a way that was different than years in the past or something. So these women come back and I, I know from speaking with them that it's a very anxiety provoking process for them. Um, when they come in, we do, you know, based on exactly what the abnormality we were worried about, or if she's come in with a lump or something, we will direct the um, workup based on what we think is best. And that might you know, it also depends on age. In younger patients, we try to do less mammography and more ultrasound. We just, we, you know, have our technologist take certain images, then we look at them. And um, at that point, we'll either decide that it's nothing to worry about. It was just normal breast tissue that was of concern or that the woman's just feeling a cyst in her breast, which is something we don't worry about. If we can't say this is nothing to worry about, we either say, well, I don't think it's anything to worry about. I want you to come back in, say, six months, and we're, gonna, we're not going to wait the full year. We might normally wait between mammograms. We want to kind of follow you a little more closely. And our guidelines for doing that are if we think it's a less than 2% chance of being breast cancer, that's what, what um, is sort of the guideline for that instruction. And then some we say um, we think you need a biopsy, and we will um, arrange that based on whichever of our imaging modalities, ultrasound, mammogram, or MRI is, is best for that particular abnormality. And, um, and sometimes we can't find anything, but we're still worried based on how, like if a woman comes in with a lump, and I, can, I do always feel it myself, if I can't find anything on my mammogram or ultrasound, uh, sometimes I refer to breast surgery so that they can do a formal clinical evaluation of the breast, uh, more formal than what I do when I have the patient with me. And sometimes a surgeon will decide to do a surgical biopsy and that can, some cancers 
um, can be felt but not seen with our imaging. So that's an important uh, part as well. well. Yeah, I guess so. So now you, so you are a, you said you're, you know, you're a radiologist, an MD that um, in a practice of central PA who specializes mm-hmm. in breast imaging. So when you say breast imaging, you know, and you think talking about either mammograms or ultrasound, I think the average woman like myself jumps to thinking, well, breast cancer, it, it, you know, she is dealing with, with mostly with cancer as the disease. But I assume that there's other other diseases, other diagnoses that come out. Is that true that you deal with? Oh, absolutely. Um, m- many of the, for the most part, we're trying to exclude breast cancer uh, okay. in many of these diagnoses. But there are other diagnoses that sort of have a well-defined pattern of management that you know we we will direct the patient to once we've identified it. Things like you know a breast cyst, we don't worry about if it's um, causing symptoms to a patient, we can aspirate that. There are certain things like fibroadenomas, which are benign growths in the breast that, that um, can be surgically excised if, you know, if they developed, you know, continue to increase in size or are worrisome to the patient. Um, there are a number of things that aren't cancer, but are associated with cancer. And we will, um, you know, direct a patient toward a a surgical, um, th- th- those tend to be surgically removed just to make sure there's not some cancer hiding around it somewhere. Lots of different things. Breast cancer, excluding breast cancer is really the biggest part of our job, but there are other aspects as well. Okay. Thank you. So Kristen, obviously, you know, women are always asking the question, you know, is there anything I can do to prevent this? You know, what's within my control? Are there lifetime choices that I'm making or lifestyle choices that I could change? And I I really want everyone to hear your answer on this. Okay. Um, well, so my make, answer- it a, make it a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, no I correct. wish I wish that the answer was that there was that there's more that that there's a lot a woman can do to reduce her risk of breast cancer. There are certain things a woman can do, but in general, that risk is is still going to be significant. Um, actually, 75% of women who develop breast cancer don't have any identifiable risk factors. So even if you do everything perfectly, you you know you have the perfect diet, the perfect weight, all of that, uh, there's still a very good chance that you could develop breast cancer, uh, even with you know no. Um, family history or anything. Um, Some of the things that are maybe the easiest for a woman to control are, one is alcohol intake. Um, Alcohol intake is uh, clearly associated with breast cancer. Even a very small amount of uh, alcohol, one drink a day, increases risk a little bit. Um, Two to five drinks per day actually increases risk one and a half times for breast cancer. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Being overweight is an increased risk. Uh, that's kind of a complex relationship where, uh, wherein if you are someone who's gained weight as an adult, it's a bigger risk than someone who's sort of been heavy all her life, perhaps. Physical activity has been shown to decrease risk by quite a bit, actually. Even just, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the William, Women's Health Initiative uh, study that was done. My mother was one of the women in that. They showed that One and a quarter to two and a half hours per week of brisk walking reduced the risk of breast cancer by 18%. So that's something that certainly a woman could do. In addition to... Per week, you said. Yes, so it's really not a whole lot of exercise, but it seemed to, um, at least in this one study, uh, have a big impact. Okay. Um, Was the Women's Health Initiative research, is that nationwide, or was it um, up here in the Northeast? No, it was nationwide. My mother was always very proud of being part of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, some other things. People really wanted to find out if there were environmental uh, factors that increased risk. They haven't found any definite association. Some things people are worried about are the plastics and some of the water bottles or some cosmetics. But really, we haven't found a clear risk for any of those. And if there is a risk, it's likely to be pretty small. Um, but I think the overall point is there's lots of things that you can do that will reduce your risk. But even even if you do all these things perfectly, you're still going to need to do the different options for screening, including mammography, because the, the goal of these screening tools is to catch cancer early. 
because if cancer is going to happen, it's much better to, to catch it early when it's very small and hasn't gone anywhere else in your body. Okay. So do you want to go through those? I know there's three components of this screening. Do you want to kind of um, talk about those and then and go into detail about maybe some of I know there's been some controversy lately about mammograms for, you know, annual mammograms for women as well as self-breast exam, et cetera. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, the three main components are the self-breast exam, which I think we've all heard about, the clinical breast exam, which is the exam by your doctor of your breasts, and the and then again, the screening mammography, which is the one that's been shown to have the strongest uh, association with decreased risk of dying from breast cancer. Um, so I guess we talk about the self-breast exam uh, first. Do you guys do those? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> meanwhile, I'm sitting over here thinking, oh, I haven't done one in a while. Maybe I should do it right now. <laughs> you know, so Molly and I are going to do a self-breast exam while you're <laughs> During this episode, uh, so funny, Kristen, because just in anticipation of knowing that you were coming on today, I totally set a gynecologist appointment for earlier this week. And he was also saying, like, you know, I told him, I just don't know how to do it. I never know if I'm doing it right. And he gave me one of those shower cards, you know, and he's like, he's like, do your breast exam. Why were you not doing your breast exam? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think part of it and I'll, I'll talk about, you know, what the recommendations are, but. I, even for myself, and I have to admit, I'm very far from, I don't do a monthly breast exam, I'll say that straight out. It's because it's, in some ways, it feels so formal, and like, you have to do it perfect, and I think that in some way may dissuade women from actually doing it, you know, they have, you have to take off all your clothes from your waist up and lay down in your bed, and I, you know, I just think that really, you just need to be aware of your breasts. And that's what's coming out from uh, from the studies that have been done. So let me tell you, for breast self-exam right now, the American Cancer Society wants women to know about the benefits and the limitations of breast self-exam, but they're not recommending that it be taught to everyone. The U.S. Pre Preventative Services Task Force, which is another big group that looks at the literature and the actual evidence that exists for doing different things, they actually advise against teaching women to do the self-breast exam. And that's sort of a big, a big deal to say that. Their recommendations are coming out of a, a big, some big studies that were done in China and Russia that looked at, compared women who were um, methodically taught to do breast exam with women who were randomly selected and not taught to do it. And what they found is that there was the same death rate from cancer in the two groups and the women who did the breast exams or were or were taught to do the breast exams actually had double the biopsy rates uh, with negative findings so a benign biopsy something was found on these self breast exams she ended up undergoing additional invasive procedures and yet in the end the uh, rate of death from breast cancer uh, wasn't reduced. So that's kind of what a lot of this is based on. That's and kind what of, we're that's kind of a shocker. It really is. I think, you know, I don't know exactly what's what goes into it, but I think part of it is that when you find a lump by your own exam or a doctor finds a lump, it does tend to be bigger than a, a lump or a cancer that we would find in mammography. We can find cancers, I think the median size of the cancer is one to one and a half centimeter found on mammography and found on either breast self-breast exam or by a doctor's breast exam, it's more like two to 2.5. So I think the point is that the improval in survival comes from finding cancer early. Finding cancer at a later stage isn't always as, as helpful. Kristen, I was just wondering, as we talk about the controversy with doing your own self-exam, um, is there is it because there's um, a fault, maybe a false confidence that, um, that that women get if they are performing an exam, so they're a self-exam, so maybe they're not, you know, going in and, and maybe getting their clinical exam regularly. I don't think that's it. Um, I don't think that you, you're saying that a woman who does it every month feels, oh, I. I'm so certain about my breasts being, you know, not having cancer in them that I'm going to forego the other options available to me. I don't, is that what you're asking? I, I guess so. Or just, I was just curious about the statistics that you were, you were mentioning about the self-exam and that, and that it doesn't, you know, that you had just kind of 
mentioned previously that and and that the controversy is that it's not right it's whether it's even helpful i, I just find that really it, it, as holly said it's kind of shocking it, it definitely is because it only makes sense that a woman should know her own body and her own breasts as well um, I, I haven't actually read those studies myself. I've just read about them. But there's a lot of question about how applicable, applicable they are to, to our country, which is certainly different than parts of China and parts of Russia, in that we, we may, I, don't, I can't say this for, <laughs> with certainty, but I imagine that our breast cancer care is pretty advanced compared to certain parts of those countries, and that if we if a woman finds a larger lump by breast self exam that in our country it may have ultimately a better outcome than in a country where perhaps not everyone gets uh, access to as high quality care again i don't know that for sure i have to say that i have some difficulty with these recommendations because women on a regular basis do find their own cancers in their breasts and i so what we're supposed to sort of guide women to do is be aware of their breasts and come in if they notice changes in their breasts. And I think the best way to be aware of your breasts and to come in with a real change in your breast is to, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say that I would think doing a self-breast exam is the wrong thing to do, especially if you do it regularly. I think the problem is a lot of women maybe wouldn't do it regularly. And so if you were to start doing it at age 20, say, and you did it every month, by the time that you fall into a category that you're at increased risk for cancer, you're really going to know your breasts. You're going to know your own lumps and bumps because every breast has some lumps and bumps in it. And if you, if you really do that, you're going to notice a change and you're going to notice a change early. But I think that, you know, that's not officially what I'm supposed to say. But the bottom line is that women are supposed to, so there's different recommendations from this U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which recommends against teaching it, and the American Cancer Society that recommends it's up to the woman. And if a woman is going to do it regularly, and if a woman understands that she may end up getting a biopsy that ultimately wasn't necessary because she didn't have cancer in that particular lump, then that should be her choice. And um, so I just, I encourage patients to be, familiar with their breasts so that they can notice changes and I just I just feel that's important it really encourages women to be active participants in their health and not just passive recipients of of you know mammography and the doctor's exam well and Kristen just judging by what you told me about that study it sounds kind of like the wonderful study about drinking wine and cancer it sounds like there may need to be a couple of other regressions done on this maybe net out a few other factors because this could be correlated based on other factors like you said actually finding it earlier because when your mammographer finds that they find it earlier whereas when you find it you find it when it's big enough to touch but god forbid you weren't doing the breast exam and it was allowed to get even bigger oh absolutely i have women who'll come in and say oh i my arm bumped into this in the shower i mean your arm bumping into something it, it would certainly be better if your fingers had bumped into it you know three months earlier or I, I just I really think it makes sense for women to sort of know what's going on with their breasts and you're right I, I like I said I don't I'm not real familiar with the studies but I also am not sure if I mean this basically said that these women were taught breast self-exam I don't know to the, the degree to which they followed those recommendations when in which how closely they actually did the breast exams was reflected in these numbers I don't I don't know that Okay. And then you, uh, Jill. What were you? There was there were a couple other recommendations, right? We were going right. through three, the three steps. components. The three components of the of of breast cancer screening. So the self exam, and then the clinical exam by your doctor. Um, yes, and which is also controversial, right, Kristen? It is. Yes, um, I'll tell you again. American Cancer Society. Their recommendations are starting at age twenty to have a clinical breast exam every three years. And that once you're 40, to have one every year. Now, again, the U.S. Pre Preventative Services Task Force actually, and they're the ones that look at the literature that exists and makes recommendations based on the evidence. They say that there's insufficient evidence to make a recommendation either way with the clinical breast exam. I still think it's important. It seems silly for a doctor who's examining, examining you to skip that part of your body, you know, uh, just from a 
common sense point of view, I, I wouldn't recommend against it. And, and again, no one is saying not to do it. It's just that there's not a lot of evidence for it at this point. So then the mammography, that meaning the mammogram, is really, the, you know, the, it's the proven way to reduce breast cancer mortality from what you've told us. And, and so, there again, so this is the third component, but there's still controversy is in this too. It's a controversy because it's an expensive screening, you know, versus obviously a clinical exam by your doctor, or is a controversy that it's not uh, as, that people think it's, it's the ultimate way to, to be, to prevent getting the breast cancer? Well, I think, I think the controversy, no one actually says they think it's too expensive. And um, I think it's more that I, I'm not sure. I, I think I'm not sure why um, so many people seem to be against mammography. Um, I'm not sure why that is, because to me, looking at the evidence that's out there, it does certainly make sense. And I can sort of summarize what I know about the evidence out there okay. um, for that, if you'd like. And also and give I, us the recommendations, if you would, just like you did sure. with the others. Yeah. And then I'd like to just touch on at some point before we're done, the cost of mammography as a whole compared to other preventative things we do in our society like seatbelts. Because if you look at those numbers, it certainly is um, something that our society should choose to spend money on because it's about the same as seatbelts per, you know, per year of life saved. But um, anyway, so the current recommendations... And I want to say what the American Cancer Society recommendations are. And these are very simple and straightforward. Starting at age 40, have, you have screening mammography every year for as long as you're in good health. And um, I'll tell you where that comes from. It comes from a number of when mammography was first started. And that was in the mid-80s when screening started to be done sort of on a, on a large scale. The, the way that this was examined was that certain women, groups of women, were invited to screening and certain women weren't invited to screening. This is how they sort of did a randomized control trial and then they could examine the outcomes of the women invited to screening and the women who were not invited to screening. So invited to screening just means, hey, we think you should come every year and get a screening mammogram. We're going to see if that makes a difference compared to these people who don't come every year. Huh. And so when you're invited to screen to screening, that doesn't necessarily mean you're actually going to go and get screening. But even just being invited to screening led to a 15% reduction in, in breast cancer deaths. Um, so, and again, that number is probably a better reduction than 15% because, again, not everyone who is invited to go to screening would go. What's up? <laughs> what is that? And not everyone shows up. Right, exactly. And so... Going beyond that, some some observational studies have been done since then that show that actually getting an annual screening mammogram results in at least a 30% reduction in breast cancer mortality. So the, the evidence out there is very strong. What a lot of people get wrapped up about is that a lot we do do a lot of biopsies and have women come back for additional pictures that turn out to be nothing. And that's the trade-off. You know, if you choose to have a screening mammogram, you might be called back for us to look at something more closely. And, you know, I tend to be careful. I tend to to have people come back if I'm if I'm worried at all and just make sure everything's OK. Um, most every patient I talk to thanks me for being careful. They certainly um, seem to be accepting of the extra time that's required uh, that, you know, maybe isn't ultimately necessary because they didn't have breast cancer, but they're happy to be, um, to have someone being careful about that. So th that's, I guess, one of the main trade-offs is the expense and the time and the anxiety that women have related to going through this process. But I think most of them would choose it. And even when it comes to a biopsy, we recommend a biopsy, but the woman is the one who's in charge of her body. And if she doesn't want the biopsy, if she'd rather just, you know, say, can I come back in six months and we'll just see if it's getting any bigger, then that's fine. And I think I think if you remember that, you know, women have control of, of their degree of involvement in this process all the way along, I think, um, I think most women would choose this. But I think a lot of women get confused by the different recommendations. And that's, so I told you the American Cancer Society recommendations, which again are very simple, starting at age 40 every year as long as you're in good health. The U.S. Pre Preventative Services Task Force in 2009 came, up, came out with new recommendations, and they 
recommended against routine screening mammography for women less than age 50. And so this was, um, this has caused actually a great deal of change in mammography, uh, you know, in, in what we do. Um, many women confused by that suggestion uh, don't come in, even though there is definitely uh, this reduction in breast cancer mortality from coming in to get your screening mammogram. That was the uproar that basically hit the, you know, the public mainstream, right, that we heard about that there's this big, you know, Change. Yeah, it, it was a while ago, but it really it had a tremendous effect. Even some states, through the state-sponsored care that's available, stopped providing mammograms for women in this age group. It, you know, it was a big. What's that? That's terrible. It is. Yes, the secretary, Health and Human Services Secretary, came out shortly after these recommendations to, you know, request that sh she came out on the side of continuing to screen women who were who are as young as 40, unless, who are of average risk. Of course, if you have high risk, you may be screened earlier than that. But, um, but still, even though she came out uh, sort of in some ways not supporting these recommendations, these changes have occurred. And I think a lot of women continue to be confused about it. And I'm not, I, I've read a, a lot about why this recommendation was made in 2009. And it seems that just it was based on a single new study that this group had, that they had that they didn't have in their, their prior recommendations, which were made in 2002. And this one study was based on mammography that was not the type of mammography we do here in the United States. We do a two-view mammogram as a screening. This was based on a single-view mammogram, you know, an initial two-view, and then every year after that, a single-view, which is obviously going to be a less thorough evaluation of the breast. And there were other sort of problems with this one particular study. And even despite those things that maybe were issues in this study, it still did show a breast cancer reduction of 15%, mortality reduction of 15%. So it, it's a little bit, you know, these, these were very controversial recommendations that came out. I personally feel very strongly that mammography does save women's lives. And, I'm, and I think that they were a little bit misdirected in these recommendations. Okay. And you being, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know this better than, you know, most anyone else out there, you know, the, being in, in, um, in the work that you do every day. So it's good to know, I guess, when we do, as we sort of summarize and, and as we publicize this particular Crash and Glass show, we should, I feel it's important to say, you know, there's controversy about mammography, but hear from a radiologist who says it saves women's lives. Period. It certainly does. Um, and I think uh, the American Cancer Society is a good place to direct women because they, I think, um, have very straightforward recommendations and uh, recommendations that at least I, I agree with. And I think many people in, in, who do the work I do agree with as well. Kristen, well, do you want to mention the seatbelts and, and, or, you know, as you said, the sort of the, some of the, the stuff about oh, the. Right. Well, I guess I should, when people say bad things about mammography or that mammography or shortcomings they see in mammography. Uh, again, part of that is that we do do a number of biopsies that ultimately aren't necessary because it, we find that whatever it was we were worried about is not cancer. That's one of the bad things. Uh, also, there's the cost, and that's part of doing these extra biopsies or having women come back, and even just the cost of screening. But the numbers I have here looked at um, the cost of, let's see, cost per year of life saved, and it's a quality adjusted year of life saved. And they say that in our society, we, we use a commonly accepted threshold of about $100,000 per year of life saved is sort of generally what people in the US consider acceptable. I don't know where that number comes from, but basically the, for women age 40 to 49, the estimated marginal cost per year of life saved was $26,200. And that compares with seatbelts and airbags, which are $32,000. So it's actually, even in this age group, that's the controversial age group from 40 to 49, it's still less expensive to save a life than, than the use of seatbelts and airbags. Wow. So, I mean, I would think that when it comes to things like this, especially where your health is concerned and when you're talking about something like cancer, you would want to err on the side of caution. You would want to err on the side of going sooner rather than going later within reason. Would that be a true I, statement, perhaps? I agree with that, and I agree. I, and I feel strongly that women really need to be 
active participants in their health. And that means being aware of their breasts and, you know, coming to get the screening mammography and, you know, talking with their doctors. I think a lot of women, myself included, actually, before I had my first mammogram, sort of put it off because, you know, maybe they're worried about it, that it's going to hurt or, and I just, I just want women to know that really they are in charge throughout the whole process. They're in charge of the decision to have a biopsy. They're in charge of every decision. And they can say when they come in for their mammogram, they can tell the technologist, I'm going to tell you when to stop because I don't want you to squeeze me too hard. And the mammography technologists don't like that, but they will, they will listen to a patient. And, I, and it makes it a less quality mammogram if we sort of don't maybe squeeze as hard as as we would like but we respect the patient's wishes but it's better than not coming and so i would encourage women who maybe just don't like the idea of the process of mammography that you know you're in charge and you make it clear to the people who are taking care of you that you're in charge and and you know just come in and it's it's the best step and it's better than doing nothing right but it's better to withstand a little a little bit of pain for <laughs> five or ten minutes <laughs> I mean, it's really quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not to not to put in my own biases into this, <laughs> but Holly and I, we feel that it's okay to have our own biases sometimes in these. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I just think. I mean, my my mammography text will complain. The patient wouldn't let me squeeze her hard enough, but they document that, and I put it in the report. I say, you know, this isn't an optimal study, but it's certainly still a very good study. And um, for the most part, I, I still think even, I just think that will keep some women away and I don't think it should. Okay. So before we sort of summarize, you know, this, this has just been just excellent, excellent information about breast health, Kristen, and I appreciate all of the, the you know, I know you did some, some research and some organizing of your thoughts and statistics, and we appreciate that very much. So before we though, summarize, I just wondered if you had anything else. I know in the outline we talked about, you know, additional workup and if a biopsy is recommended. But I think you did you did cover that a little at the beginning. So is there anything else there that, you know, I feel like we've discussed a lot about. We've just discussed some lifestyle and choices that you can make to reduce risk. And, and we talked a lot about screening and, and diagnosis. So anything else that you had that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I guess I didn't talk that much about biopsy. I, what I would want to say about that is I think it, it sounds scary to have someone put a needle into your breast, and it is scary. I wouldn't like that. But, again, you're, the woman is in charge the whole time, and I find that most women, women are very comfortable during a biopsy. They are, you know, they are surprised at, at it being as easy as it is. I can't say that's the case for everyone, but it sounds scary, but it's really – maybe not as, as bad as it sounds. And I've even had a, a woman fall asleep when she was getting a, a biopsy wow. and start snoring. So <laughs> then, you know, you're, you're, doing, uh, you're doing your anesthesia very well if that happens. So, I mean, that, I guess I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's another thing that really worries women. And as long as you have a radiologist who is understanding and caring, I mean, I tell my patients, I'm going to stop. If you tell me to stop, I'm going to absolutely stop what I'm doing. You're in charge of your body, and I'm not going to do anything that you don't want me to do. And that way, she feels control through this whole process. And uh, I think women should demand that. Um, yeah, that's a great, what a nice, you know, what what a nice um, atmosphere it would be, you know, that would be, especially when you're going through something scary like a, a breast, a biopsy of a lump, yeah. Well, and especially because I think, that goes for healthcare in general. I think a lot of people don't really feel in control of their health care, that they can really have conversations with their doctors. And I think that's really unfortunate because I think it leads to a certain amount of anxiety around visiting the doctor that's really unnecessary. And uh, and I wonder, I wonder if you could give just some tips, I mean, in general, but especially when going in to talk to someone like your, your breast cancer doctor, because obviously that's a very, very sensitive topic. Just general, obviously, in addition to a couple that you've given us, general tips on how women can go in and really what's a good guideline on how to really develop a good relationship and a good feel for your doctor and make sure that you're getting the most out of your appointment? Well, well, I can sort of just comment on 
radiologist because that's what I am. I mean, in general, you have to feel like your doctor is respecting you, obviously, and not just telling you what to do. Um, and it depends on the patient as well. Some patients don't want any decision. They, you know, they want to be told what to do. Um, and I'm, I'm sometimes not sure how a patient, where she is on that spectrum. And so I will, what I tell my patients is this is my official recommendation. But in most of medicine, everything is not black and white. There's a lot of gray. And you could say, you know what, I, my official recommendation is to do a biopsy here. But if you're a person that doesn't want a biopsy, then certainly we'll just you know, have you come back in six months or in three months. And then there's a tremendous range in how patients feel about that. Some patients ha- cannot tolerate any risk and, and they, you know, wouldn't even really want to tolerate a six month follow up. They would want something biopsy. And there, there's a lot of gray in how we can interpret things and having the, the patient's um, thoughts on that really helps me a lot. And so I would recommend to to patients when they're talking to their radiologist or whatever other doctor is to, to share their opinions because it really um, it really does affect at least in my practice how I'll you know how we'll we'll end up treating the patient. Wow, no, that was really helpful. Do we want to get into some chick news now, Jill? Yeah, I think so. I think um, I think we covered. We covered the breast, <laughs> breast health very well. <laughs> Which is and, very important so we don't have any wardrobe malfunctions. Right, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, we need to cover our breasts. <laughs> and um, I guess I, I just wanted to say that the lifestyle decisions that you did mention, Kristen, just to kind of, those sure. are things that maybe a, you know, a lot of people, it was alcohol was kind of a, you know, definitely the first one you mentioned about more mm-hmm. than um, three to five drinks a day, right? It was two to five that increases, but it's sort of, you know, just the more alcohol, the increased risk. Okay. It's it's a continuum. It's not like a continuum. Yeah. I think that's important though to mention, you know, because I, I think alcohol, you know, plays a part in a lot of, a lot of health issues. So, so two to five drinks that are more alcohol, the bigger risk. And then obviously, um, but if I could just interject with that, I don't, I believe that alcohol actually in small amounts is helpful in other diseases like heart disease. I think that's the case. So, you know, it's not always so black and white about what the right thing to do is. Yeah, I know um, it's not. Holly, that's something we should, I think we should do a show about alcohol <laughs> and, <laughs> and the pros and cons. Um, and then, Krista, the other main um, lifestyle that you mentioned was the exercise. Ex- yep, yeah, exercise seems to have a protective effect. Keeping your weight down is, seems to be helpful. Uh, you know, all the diet things we hear about for all other cancers as well, you know, rich in vegetables, fruit, poultry, fish, that sort of stuff. Um, breastfeeding lowers risk a little bit. I don't know if I mentioned that. No. That's- yeah. And having children at a younger age. <laughs> well, I blew that one up. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, we don't like, us business women don't like to hear that in this day. And yeah. Age. <laughs> <laughs> having children, uh, having Holly, no was, children increases your risk. So it's. Yeah. Yeah. I, Holly, I was 32 when I had my first child. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no worries. Okay, great. Well, that was, Kristen, thank you again. I know we're going to talk a little bit about chick news before we wrap, wrap, but that was um just so thorough and so thoughtful and some really great recommendations. And I hope our, all our listeners, you know, get something out of that about getting in there and getting the, you know, do not just a self exam, um, but the, you know, the the mammography is is very important. Uh-huh. So that's what I took away. <laughs> All right, fabulous. It was fun to be with you guys. Yeah. You, um, so go ahead, Holly. Jump right in. All right. Let's move on to some chick news. This is uh, the fun part of our show sometimes, and today actually it starts out a little gross. Uh, Apparently, a 42-year-old woman in China actually killed a man by squeezing his testicles over a parking spot. Um, (laughs) Somebody, this sounds like, I mean, Boston is extreme about (laughs) parking spots, but I think this, um, this might take the cake. That's pretty good. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. Well, I think the, the really shocking, I mean, 
the whole story is really shocking, but the shocking part about it to me is this is a 42-year-old, or this, this woman, 41, sorry, she's 41 years old, and she was riding her scooter to pick up her kids at school, or to pick up her child at school, and she tried to park her scooter in front of this guy's store, and he came out and he said, you can't park here, and then they started uh, fighting, and then there was physical confrontation, so then she called in her brother and her husband to help her, and then she... Uh, so credit for her own hands? <laughs> if you will, yes. Thank you, Jill. That is the best way to put it. She took the matter into her own hands. And I, I mean, you know, I am all for women taking control of situations, but this just seems extreme, to <gasps> say the least. Like, I mean, there's no indication here if these two have, this is news from China, it's uh, from the website China News 24, and it, it doesn't seem that these two had any prior interaction as far as anyone knows. I just, I find this very, I don't know, I don't know, what do you think, Jill? I, I'm stunned. Yeah, well, it was a physical fight, I guess it ended up being a physical fight, and she lost it. Yeah, she just, she must have had a lot of, um, she had some road rage and <laughs> some general life rage and she took it out on the shop owner that's this is in is it Hainan province so i don't maybe you have some um insight holly since you just went to china do you i mean i'm being serious here actually about like any cultural insight about because i you know about the I don't know about Ch Chinese. Well, most of the insight that I have now, this is very different. Um, I have never been to Haiku City. I don't know anything about that city. You know, I went to the big ones, the big Beijing, Hangzhou, Shanghai, what they call first tier cities. The only thing that I was told about the Chinese was, I mean, obviously, from my personal experience, they have a very different way of speaking to one another. They're more honest about things. You know, for instance, it's not uncommon to have someone say to you, a friend, someone you like, say to you, you look tired today or you're getting fat. Maybe you need to take better care of yourself, you know, as we talked about on the other podcast. But in general, with strangers, we were told that a Chinese person would never talk to us without some sort of malintention, that it is cultural for them to actually be very deferent and very much avoiding of confrontation, so that that's more the social norm there. And so I, I find this very just sort of mind-boggling, you know, it sort of seems like there's got to be something else going on here. Perhaps this woman's not particularly mentally stable. I'm not really sure. Yeah, wow. All right, well, moving on. <laughs> um, I know another little bit. It actually, this reminds me of one last, uh, one last question that I forgot to ask our doctor. Um, and it, it, So uh, the segue is that it's about Kim Kardashian, and um, I guess she is toying with running for mayor uh, in Glendale, California. But speaking of Hollywood and some of the Hollywood trends, Kristen, I forgot to ask you about implants and because it's sort of that's a I think that's a pertinent question when it comes to breast health uh is it and so I, I guess I'm, I'm segueing with Kim Kardashian even though <laughs> she may, doesn't have implants but this, that I guess but that general sort of you know the general Hollywood attitude is are implants at all um a, a risk you know with breast cancer is there any correlation there I have no idea. We uh, obviously it would be a good question to ask when maybe if Kristen comes on again sometime. Okay, <laughs> be kind of exciting. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So, what do you know about this? Any anything else? This uh, Kardashian news? Well, so apparently Kim Kardashian was at the White House Correspondence Center with Fox Television, and she said, "Hey, I'm a Democrat, but my parents are my parents are super Republican, which is why Mom Kris Jenner was able to get her the seat." And while being interviewed, she made a reference to the fact that she's, she's thinking about running for mayor of Glendale, which when I first read this article, I thought that was really funny. Like, I think she said something like, stay tuned. I always set my goals really high. Oh and God. I sort of thought it was a joke. But apparently on the show, they have a clip of her saying on the Kardashian show or on uh, Chloe and Lamar, which is her sister show, where she said, I've decided I'm going to run for mayor of Glendale and <laughs> that she bought a house in Glendale and that she's looking into the requirements to run for mayor with her assistant. So, I mean, uh, that could happen. <laughs> yeah, it could happen. You know, I mean, look at, we, well, she, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the best uh, 
the, it could be her role model. <laughs> Ooh, I'd rather have Kinky Friedman than Kim Kardashian. I'll tell you that right now. And Good remember Sonny Bono too. Yeah, Sonny well, Sonny Bono ran. apparently was great, right? Like, apparently he was a mayor, and people liked him. He did some good things. Oh, he became high, much higher than that. He he became a, a uh, I think he became a, a United States congressman somewhere along the way, didn't he? Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I, I've been, I feel like I've been saying this a lot today. We are on the World Wide Web these days here on our podcast, so it's not really difficult for us to find this information out. And he, let's see, political career, looking in the book of knowledge, as my friend Ed likes to call it, uh, he was, let's see, this is interesting. So he was the only member of Congress, so he was in Congress, to have scored a number one pop single on the uh, Billboard Top 100 chart. So there you go. He was in the Senate, actually. A senator. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I knew. I, I, wasn't, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to say senator because that's a little more prestigious. I wasn't sure if he had been elected to the Edward California senator. Yeah, that's very impressive, and that scares the crap out of me because <laughs> I, I do think the Kardashians are smart, smart ladies. Like, uh, in general, Kris Jenner, her daughters, and, you know, I think, you know, sometimes I feel like poor Brody gets, like, the the short end of the stick, but, you know, even, even, even the Jenner family, I feel like they're together very intelligent, or maybe it's Ryan Seacrest doing as a producer, you know, he's a very strong force, but they seem to be very intelligent about marketing themselves, and to right. be honest with you, being a politician really is just a giant game of marketing yourself. That's true. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that the Kardashians' sisters would have had, you know, a, been um, a world, uh, oh, how do I say this, you know, high, high IQ types that, you know, just are very very well well spoken i mean i think of them as a little bit not quite like that kind of academic type but they do seem to have great business sense maybe that's the mom who has the really great business sense and she's been able to um, pass that along to them and i would i would say as to kind of as we wrap up our last thoughts here that being a politician and it's a big election that's going to get going here in obama and romney but i think being a politician is a giant game of marketing. I would absolutely agree with you, Holly, and that was well said. Well, Jill, it's been great hanging with you and learning all about chicks with tatas this week. <laughs> yes, that was a great show, and it's, it's nice to make, you know, to have it. It was a very heavy, very heavy topic, um, but we'll have a, a light, <laughs> and the name of the show will be Light. <laughs> and so have a great week from those of us here at the Crashing Glass Podcast. Bye! Sweet.